Bible reading today is from Exodus um, chapter 1, verses 1 to 22, and then chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, which if you've got the church's blue Bibles, uh, are on page 58 and 59. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali. Gad and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, for the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increasing in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built built Pitom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Sifra and Puah, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Moving on to chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Well, I remember once uh, a conversation I uh, had, it was probably uh, over 20 years ago uh, now, really, uh, but I remember it because it was a, a brilliant opportunity that I had to uh, share the gospel with uh, a friend, someone who wasn't a Christian, um, but I also remember it because uh, I messed it up. <laughs> now, that happens a lot, doesn't it? Do you not have that experience when you talk to people and you think, oh, why did I say that? And the conversation with a guy called uh, Brian, we were talking about God. I had had the opportunity to explain something about uh, what I believed as a Christian. Uh, Brian listened uh, very respectfully. And then as the conversation progressed, he said to me, and I do believe that there must be someone or something up there that's bigger than us, who's stronger and is in control of things. And I said, that's good. And that was really the end of the conversation. But the thing is, it's not really good, is it? Just believing that there's a a bigger power or a controlling force doesn't actually mean very much at all. A statement like that wouldn't be that uncommon in our society. There was a, a survey fairly recently which asked people if they believed in God or a higher power. And the people who answered yes or weren't quite sure, it was over 59%. So it's quite common that people might believe in a God or a higher power or at least be open to that possibility. But it doesn't really tell us much about what they actually believe about the true and living God. Uh, 
You see, the question I should have asked Brian when he said those things to me, I should have said to him, yes, but which God do you believe in? Which God? Many people might believe in a God, but believing in a God doesn't mean that we believe in the God who is real and true and living. It may just be that we believe in an idol or something which is not real. The question is, which God do we believe in? And as a church family, we regularly answer that question as we say uh, the Apostles' Creed together. What do we believe in? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We believe in the Holy Spirit. You see, as as Christians, we believe that the true God, the one God who is real, is Father, Son, and Spirit. One of the the church fathers who wrote on these things, uh, I think, brilliantly kind of put it. He said, no sooner do I think about the, the one, the oneness of God, than I'm illuminated by the splendor of the three. And then no sooner do I distinguish them as Father, Son, and Spirit, I'm carried back to the one. That is, when we as Christians think about God as one, immediately we then start to think, oh yes, but he's also Father, Son, and Spirit. But then when we start to think of him as Father, Son, and Spirit, we remember that God is one. It's this constant moving backwards and forwards, remembering God is three in one. Remembering who our God is. Now, and I start this way for this series in the book of Exodus because Exodus is going to be a, a series and a book which will help us to come face to face with who God really is. We will see what God is like. We will see his plans and his purposes and how he interacts with his world and his people. Exodus will help us to think about the God that we follow as Christians. Now, of course, the the way the Bible was formed means that it was built over uh, many years. And so it's not until we get to the New Testament that we get to that uh, fuller understanding of God as Father, Son, and Spirit. God reveals himself, if you like, in the Bible in stages. Sometimes it's called progressive revelation. God progressively reveals more of himself until we get to Jesus. And we are told that here is the full revelation of God. But when we are in Exodus, we are going to be learning what God is like, what his character is, how we can trust in him. Yes, there'll be times as well which will challenge our understanding of God. But my hope is and my prayer is that we will be able to start to answer the question of which God do we follow with greater certainty? greater clarity as we go through uh, this series in the book of Exodus. So when someone says to us, no, I believe in a a God, I believe there must be a a God up there or a higher power, we can ask them, well, which God do you mean? And we might even be able to help them to come to see the God who is really there. And so this morning, as we come to Exodus 1 uh, and 2, we are going to be learning about our God which might seem a strange thing to say when we come to Exodus 1 and 2, because these chapters present to us the people of God suffering. It's quite a horrific chapter, isn't it? Did you just pick up in the Leila read? Here are a people group, the Israelites living in Egypt, and they are being oppressed and even facing ethnic cleansing. God's people are suffering. Let's just think about it. Here's this a group of Israelites living in the land of Egypt. They were uh, refugees who had come to Egypt many years before because there was a famine in their own land. And now they have grown from a, a group of 70 refugees into this huge ethnic group in Egypt. And the king of Egypt begins to see them as a threat to national security. Did you see that in verse 9? The king says, look... The Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal with them shrewdly, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. He begins to see the Israelites as a threat. Verse 10. 
And so he seeks to do something about it. And the first stage is forced labor. Did you see it in verse 11? So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the field. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Do you see the Israelites, this ethnic group, God's people, oppressed and forced to build cities for the Egyptians? While they are oppressed and work hard, they still grow, and so the impression only increases. However, this oppression through forced labor is not good enough for the king of Egypt, so he calls those two Hebrew midwives, Shipra and Pua. Do you see what he says to them? Verse 16. When you are helping Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, If you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. It's quite shocking, isn't it, really? These uh, two Hebrew midwives, though they they reject the king's directive. They let the boys live. We're told they do this because they fear God. And so at the end of the chapter, Pharaoh doubles down on his policy to kill all the boys And he gives that uh, um, order to all the people in verse 22. Every Hebrew boy that is born must be thrown into the Nile, but let every girl live. State-sanctioned ethnic cleansing. You can't quite imagine, can you, what it must have been like to live in such a place? To live under those kind of conditions, the fear, the anxiety, that constant threat of violence, not being sure whether you can trust anybody. But you see, in all of this, did you notice that God seems to be absent? Now, you might ask the question, where is God in all of this? He doesn't seem to be doing anything. And of course, do we not sometimes feel like that as Christians, as God's people? when we're going through maybe really difficult times and hard times in our lives and we want it to change and it feels like God is doing nothing. We might think, well, surely God doesn't want this for my life. Why is nothing changing? God's not doing anything. He doesn't care for me. We might feel that because of ill health that we're experiencing but it seems that we're having to endure life slipping by year after year going past with ill health being there all the time. Or maybe you're looking for a change in life, a change in circumstances in life. But it all just seems to go on as if nothing is happening. Or maybe you look at the wider world and think, what's going on? Nothing seems to change. Everything just seems so random and chaotic. What's God doing? That's the kind of situation I think we get to in Exodus chapters 1 and 2. However, I think as we look more closely at these uh, chapters, what we'll actually see is that God is far from doing nothing. And that the God is absent and indifferent thesis doesn't quite meet the facts of what we read here. And what we'll find is that God is actually keeping his promises to his people. We will see the promise keeping God. Because what we'll see here is that God is sovereignly working to achieve the fulfillment of his promises, even in this most difficult of times for his people. But what we'll also see is that he's, if you like, he's doing it behind the scenes. Now at this point, God is he's working here. He's not providing a great, amazing miracles at this point. There's no words of knowledge. There's no uh, revelation that comes to people. It's just all in the background. And yet God is keeping his promises. 
And I think that's often how God actually works. The, new, the Bible, it picks up that all time and again, that God works, but often it is just behind the scenes. But that we're to trust him in it. And so what do we find in these uh, chapters? Well, I think, uh, firstly, we need to observe the connections to the book of Genesis. Genesis is the, the first book in the Bible, and it, uh, Exodus obviously follows along after. In fact, the, in the Hebrew, the first word in the, in the book of Exodus is the word and. Uh, Genesis comes and then Exodus begins with and. It follows on uh, closely. But there's two particular connections to Genesis that we see in these uh, chapters. I'll take them in chronological order. And the first is that there's a connection to God's command right at the beginning um, of uh, Genesis that God makes to Abraham. Um, um, who are the first two people? Adam and Eve. God makes to Adam and Eve um, right back at the beginning um, where God says to them, be fruitful and multiply. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 1, God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. That was God's um, uh, command, if you like, to all of humankind in the world. He repeats it to, to Noah after the flood, when it's just Noah and his sons and their wives. And God says, be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the earth. That's one of God's original purposes for his people in the world. And you see that is picked up in, Genesis, in Exodus chapter 1. Look at verses 6 and 7. See if you can see the language. <clears throat> now Joseph and all his brothers of that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Do you see the connections? They are exceedingly fruitful. They multiply. They increase. They fill the land. God said back at the beginning, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. You see, God's plan here in the lives of the Israelite nation is being worked out. But there's more because in Genesis 2, we also see uh, that God's plan, from our perspective, it looks like God's plans are threatened when Adam and Eve reject God, turn away from him. They face the fall and God's judgment and all the people after follow after that uh, way. Of course, God's plan was never threatened. It just seemed like that to us. But as uh, Genesis progresses, God makes great promises to Abraham. Promises which actually shape the rest of the Bible and our understanding of what God is doing. The promises to Abraham are essential, if you like, to understand the Bible. Flick back to uh, Genesis chapter 12. I think it's worth um, uh, coming there together. So if you've got a Bible, <coughs> uh, come back to Genesis chapter 12, which is uh, page 13 in the, the Blue Church Bibles. Uh, Genesis 12. These are the, the promises which become uh, foundational to the rest of the Bible God makes to, to Abraham, or Abram as he was called at this point. See verse 1, of Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And then down to verse 7, we read these words. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. And so he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. See, in Genesis chapter 12, God makes, there's really three great promises he makes here. Firstly, he promises that Abraham would become a great nation. He would have many descendants. In verse 7, he promises that they would have a land, the place where God would dwell with his people. And he also promises that through one of Abraham's descendants, the whole world would be blessed which is why it's really significant that when Jesus comes, he's a descendant of Abraham, the one through whom the world is blessed. 
But the promise which is picked up in Exodus is that promise that um, Abraham's descendants would become a great nation. Flick back to uh, uh, Exodus if you've uh, got your Bibles there again. And see how it works out. You see, we're being reminded of this all the way through this chapter. Verse 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin. Dan, and Naphtali. Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Do you see these? These are the children of uh, Jacob, who was also called Israel who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. You see, we're being, we're being reminded here that this is the family line of Abraham. This is a God's promise that he's been making to um, his people. And it's made explicit in the verses we read at the end of chapter 2. Did you hear? Um, verse 24, God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. You see, we're being reminded about this covenant, the promises that God made back in Genesis uh, to his people. Promises he made to Abraham and then repeated to Isaac, Abraham's son, and repeated to Jacob, Isaac's son. And what we see through uh, Exodus chapter 1 is that despite efforts to thwart these promises, God is keeping his promise. You see, it starts in verse 6. We read it before. Now, Joseph and all his brothers in that generation died, but Israel, the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly. They increased in numbers and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. You see, God fulfilling his promise, the nation growing, the people getting bigger. So numerous that the land was filled with them. And then notice as you go through, the king of Egypt, he tries to oppress the people so that they will shrink, so they won't be as numerous. But did you see the result of the forced labor, verse 12? But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. And so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. Do you see that? Oppressed. Pharaoh's trying to stop God's plan, if you like, but the people are still growing. And then the next incident, again, it's remarkable. These two Israelite midwives, they refuse to obey the king of Egypt. They don't they kill the Israelites. And so they are summoned to explain themselves to the king of uh, Egypt. And then one, one commentator writes this. He says, uh, they get away with an excuse so bad that you realize God must be involved. Do you see what they say in verse 19? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwife arrives. <laughs> it's like the, the lamest excuse ever. And yet they get away with it. And verse 20, so God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. Do you see, despite the, the plan of the king of Egypt to kill the Hebrew boys but they just keep increasing and because the midwives feared God he gave them their families of their own in chapter 2 we, uh, we focus from the, the, kind of the big picture of Israel's nation down to uh, one family and to Moses who enters on the stage and we'll see again God remarkably saving someone uh, through the waters of the Nile we're going to look at that more in our uh, growth groups. So I'm not going to uh, look at that anymore now, though. But when you get to the end of chapter 2, then, you might think it was saying that God had forgotten about the Israelites, and suddenly, when the king died, he remembered again. But actually, the end of chapter 2 is really a summary of everything that has been happening. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry of for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And so God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. You see, God's going to do uh, more. That's where the, the rest of the book's going. But it starts here. Here. 
And it shows that while it might seem at first that God is absent, that God is doing nothing, that he's unconcerned, that he's forgotten about his people, this chapter shows that no, God knows, God hears, God sees, and God is working out his plan in the lives of his people. And that should be a huge encouragement for us and a huge comfort for us as we live in this world. Notice a, a few elements of this. Often God works his plan out behind the scenes. It's often in the case, isn't it, that it's, we can't work out what God's plan is in the moment. You ever said things, I just can't see what God is doing here. I, I can't work it out. And even after the event, sometimes we can't see what the purpose was or the plan was. But Exodus 1 teaches us that even when we can't see all of those things, it doesn't mean that God is doing nothing. Now this part of the, the Israelites' life lasted for many, many years. Maybe they talked to each other and said, do you remember those promises that God made to, to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob? What's he doing now? We, we, we're suffering here under the king of Egypt. Is God doing anything? And yet, you see, we're being told here in Exodus, yes, God was doing something. He was fulfilling his plans and his purposes. And that's true in our lives too. God is working out his plan in our lives. But we can't always see it. He works behind the scenes often. And I don't think in the Bible we get that, we don't get any encouragement to try and delve behind the curtain, if you like, to try and find out what those things are. We're called to just trust in God who's made promises to keep us and to work in our lives and to achieve his purposes. And we see that here in Exodus and right through the Bible. Do you remember what we were seeing in Luke's gospel a few weeks ago? God's plan being worked out in Jesus. That his plan was that Jesus would suffer and die and be raised and rule at God's right hand and come again. That uh, forgiveness of sins were to be preached to all the nations. That's what God's plan is. And God is working out that plan even now. And he's working out the good of his people now. So God often works behind the scenes, but we can trust him. But secondly, as we think about the comfort that understanding this means, and this is a hard one, I think, just because God is working out his plan for our lives doesn't mean our lives will be ones of untrammeled blessing. Sometimes God's people suffer while God works out his plans. There are some theologies around which say that if we are God's people, that means that we will experience blessing upon blessing in our lives. And that might be wealth or good health or a sense of being fulfilled in our lives. And if we're not experiencing that, it's because we've not had enough faith. And yet the Bible shows time and time again that following our God in this world means that at times we will suffer. And we will face all the difficulties of life that anyone else in this world feels. Now, it's a hard thing to hear that, isn't it? But I think it's also a liberating thing. Now, many of us here this morning, we know what it is to suffer and to face hard times. And isn't it a comfort to know that hard times don't mean that God is being unfaithful to us? that he's indifferent to us, that he's not keeping his promises to us or working out his plan in our lives. And we see in these chapters, there was so much that was hard for these Israelites. They were oppressed, forced labor. These two midwives, what a situation that they were placed in, facing that, the, the horrific prospect of ethnic cleansing. 
And I think for the Israelites here, it was for an extended period of time. We quite rightly, don't we? We don't like suffering. We want it to end quickly. And yet that might not be God's immediate plan for our lives. Suffering might be extended. It might be short. Or we might even be spared. But God is still working out his promises in our lives. And Exodus 1 and 2 are showing us that we can trust God through the hardest times of our lives. Because he is working out his plans in the midst of suffering, even when we can't work out what the purpose is. But also see this, it's maybe during these times that we are being called to fear the Lord. Again, these two uh, midwives, these amazing women, uh, Shipra and Pua. Uh, did you hear just that little phrase? The mid in verse 17, the midwives, however, feared God. And did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. That's what we are being called to do in many ways. In the hardest of times, we're being called to fear the Lord, to trust in him. In the knowledge that God is working out his plans. And that nothing will thwart his promises. That as we live our lives trusting in him, following him, fearing the Lord, that we are building treasure in heaven. That as we live our lives trusting him, we have an inheritance which is being kept for us in heaven, which nothing will be able to take away. It's been protected for us. And that God has promised and is working in our lives and in the lives of the world, in the, in the, the, the whole of our world. To bring people into his kingdom. To bring his new heavens and his new earth. In which all sadness, sickness and death will be done away with. And as God's people we are being called to trust in our sovereign God. Who keeps and works out his promises for us. Let me uh, lead us uh, in a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to these chapters in Exodus and they are hard to hear in many ways as we see your people suffer and as we know that we suffer too in this world. And yet, Heavenly Father, we thank you that in these chapters, even in these dark chapters, we see you working out your plans and your purposes. And we thank you that you still do that today. Would you help us to trust in you even when all seems dark and when suffering presses in, that we would be able to trust you, knowing that your plans and your purposes will not fail and that they are good. As so we pray, you would help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Your work is alive to all who hear and obey. Your word endures forever.